panel today looks at the, the chill effect. Uh, we've all had it, that moment when you hear something in a piece of music and shivers run down your spine or the little hairs on the back of your neck stand up. And uh, Mari's piece, Alt, has a kind of ghostly quality, which is why she's chosen it for us today. is obviously not the only person that will be on our little panel, our discussion today. Let me introduce you to the rest of the gang. Uh, beginning with Psyche Louie, she is uh, assistant professor currently at Wesleyan University, but about to start taking over in the music and creativity department at Northeastern University. Please welcome Psyche Louie. And a professor of psychology and neural science at NYU, David Purple. <laughs> Assistant professor of psychology at SUNY Purchase, Megan Curtis. From the University of Connecticut, professor of physics and psychology, Ed Large. So, Psyche, you are also a violinist, so you would have known <laughs> all the technical stuff that was going into Mari's piece. But um, was it ghostly sounding? And if so, why? What, makes, what would make a piece have that kind of character to it? I thought it was ghostly sounding. Um, and I think, to me, it comes down to um, the fulfillment and violation of expectations. Right? So I think the piece had a lot of dissonance, had a lot of bow noise. And I think our brains by this age, right, we're, we're, we're primed to, um, to think about sounds as being consonants, especially in music. And so when you add a little bit more you know, noise to the bow and, uh, or you play closer to the bridge, right, I mean, that uh, gives you that shivery feeling um, that is dissonance. And I think that um, that's what makes uh, a piece feel kind of unexpected and eerie. And I think it's that interplay between the unexpected and like, and then it's kind of more consonant resolutions of sounds that um, makes us get the chills. Um, Ed, you, you do a lot of studying of this, you know, mm -hmm. vibration, oscillation, waveform, that sort of thing. Right. Uh, it can actually have the opposite effect of, of putting people off, of kind of distancing them from what they're hearing, right? Sure, sure. Um, you know, one of the things, I mean, obviously um, expectation is very important, but one of the things that happens when you listen to those kind of sounds is, is or any sound, is that the brain stem, you know, the early parts of the auditory system, literally are, uh, are synchronizing with the sound on a cycle-by-cycle -cycle basis, and that has really, um, you know, it can make uh, even a single sound, not even two sounds in a row, but, you know, those kind of harmonics that Mari was doing, um, very emotional and, and you know, really um, give you the chills, just that one note even. But it will be a very individual response. Yeah. You know, what works for one person will not work for another, uh, which, Megan, I know you, you've, you, you really kind of, have worked a lot with targeting how individuals respond to things like music, right? To a certain extent. Um, <clears throat> so the, it, there is a lot of individual variability with how people respond to certain songs. So a song that might create an intensely emotional experience for me might not create any sort of experience for you. <clears throat> and is there a way of, I mean, has neuroscience gotten to the point where it can kind of codify what the parameters are that make it likely for one kind of music to affect a person that way as opposed to another? Well, 
<clears throat> I, I think that there's th there are some predictors that, that can tell you uh, who is most likely to respond emotionally to a certain type of piece. So for instance, if you have a personal history with the, with the piece, if it's well known to you, if you're a musician, if you've played the piece before, that's going to create a deeper emotional response. Uh, and the context in which it occurs is going to influence how you respond to the music. Uh, so there, you know, there are some things that, that do seem to have predictive value. However, there, there's still tremendous variability across different individuals. Right. So, right. so. The, y there's a lot there that we're going to unpack during the course of this conversation, things like context and uh, expectation. Uh, David, it seems like maybe 25, 30 years ago, um, music and neuroscience seemed like distinct fields. And then gradually, in the wake of Oliver Sacks' work, neuroscience began to kind of look at music and then really focus on music, and now it's like obsessed with music. <laughs> <laughs> what, what has your experience been of, you know, this kind of progression of, of interest on the part well, of neuroscientists? And in first, this we have to, of course, say it, and neuroscience is obsessed with everything. Because neuroscience can explain everything. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that as a professor of neuroscience. Uh, so, um, but it's true that the w one big change has been the availability of techniques to measure the human brain that weren't available 25 years ago. And in the last 25 years, we've uh, kind of optimized and developed brain recording techniques from uh, awake behaving humans, listening to music, listening to speech, that allow us to monitor what's going on and begin to come up with kind of more satisfying mechanistic answers. And some of us work on this. And of course, uh, it's often much more compelling and fun to study something like music uh, than the usual stuff we do in a lab, which is you come to my lab, you sit in a machine and you hear beep, <laughs> beep, <laughs> beep. And then 90 minutes later, you're still hearing beep. Mm -hmm. uh, that is necessary. That's how we sort of build up the parts list of how a mind and brain are organized. But in the end, we're interested in compelling experiences like music. You know, why do we find Mari's piece mesmerizing? Not because it's beep, 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 because it's something other in our head that's going on. And that's what we're trying to figure out. So uh, if you're able to take an fMRI, for example, a functional mm -hmm. MRI of, of a brain as it's in the act of listening to music, yeah. Um, I mean, one of, one of the interesting things is music seems to affect the, the brain globally. Mm -hmm. it's, there is no, like, one part of the brain as there is for speech. Music seems to be all, yeah. all over the place. Yeah, so let me disagree with you already. Okay. <laughs> so so uh, there is, th the same is true for speech. Speech is just as complicated as music. So let, let's go right into the meat of this, right? So, uh, so um, you asked Mari, why does it seem ghostly? Or ask, you asked Psyche, why is it ghostly? Well, the, there is a huge individual differences, which we're going to talk about, and Psyche has actually a very influential recent paper about, what, about the wiring diagram that is. But when I listened to it, my individual, uh, my response, it, was, it reminded me of animals. You probably had nothing like that in mind, your dog or some bird, but I thought this was a scene of many different animal sounds coming together in weird right. ways, and that was my interpretation of it. So in the privacy of my own mind, I'm entitled to interpret music any way I like. Yeah. This is not the case for speech. In the case of speech, uh, meaning is conveyed by putting things together. You, can, you pull out uh, particular words, and then you put the words together to construct meaning. Uh, and uh, th that is much more directed in some sense than it is in the musical case. So we have our own private interpretation much more so, and that's partly the you know, tremendous individual variability. So if I say to you, um, man bites dog, we all, all uh, six of us will have the same interpretation of what that means, as will the rest of you, and if you don't, come see me later. Um, <laughs> but if you hear even you know, a few bars of music, you will not. And therein lies a really big difference, and that big difference is uh, carried by pretty complicated networks that are true for the speech case and the music case. So it's an elaborate story. Well, I think yes and no, right? I mean, I think that it's a bit of a strong statement to think that if you have one piece of music that we don't all hear it the same way. I mean, I think we can all take different em emotional interpretations from it, but I think part of the goal of composition, in a way, is to align 
a comp composer's intention with the audience's intentions, right? Otherwise, if, if there's no alignment, and this is from Fred Laird, I was just down the street, if, you, if there's no alignment, then you could say that a piece is kind of failing, right? And so we have to find the common ground, musicians have to find the common ground between what we're making and what the audience is hearing. And I think that that comes down to like us having similarly wired brains to a certain extent, but of course there's lots of differences. Um, so I, mean, I think that it's not so simple that you just can take whatever you want out of music. I think that there are some commonalities. And uh, coming from the other side, because I'm on your other side, um, and it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not as though um, language is that simple either. I mean, I mean, man bites dog is one thing, but a, a more complicated, uh, a more complicated sentence, a more complicated discourse, people interpret in many different ways also. So, um, and that's one of the interesting things about language and music is it's got this multi-faceted uh, kind of meaning that we can uh, that we can see. Well, coming from the other the other side, <laughs> the other other side, as an interpreter, I mean, I do classical, whatever, right? And if you're trained in a violin, you know that you have to practice the same thing over and over and over and over and over again <laughs> until you're technically, right? So how do you keep yourself fresh and how do you uh, present yourself emotionally coherent to the audience so that you're not just tracing your notes, right? Mm -hmm. So what I do, personally, this is like behind the, you know. Mm -hmm. Tell us how the sausage <laughs> is made. <Go> ahead. <laughs> <laughs> uh, industrial secret that you're not supposed to know. It's like, no, just my, my own process. I use the Stanislavski, like a, a you know, actor's a mm. a method, method, act acting, yeah, yeah. method acting. Uh, I, I read a lot of Stanislavski when I was young, and uh, I built my own emotional subcontext, right? Uh -huh. So I learned early on that um, if I practice and practice, it, I just am bored on stage because I've done this before. And if I'm bored, you are bored, right? So you know, not for me not to be bored, I have to build this subcontext of emotions so that I can follow that thing. But then I have to choose a, a subtext maybe a day or two before. Maybe the conversation I had, a book I read, a news I saw, some story that I kind of lay out emotionally huh. and then you know I that way I can present that but then you are not seeing that you don't know the book I read but it, emotional uh, logic is there so you can follow the, the logic that's how I do it I, I, I want to come back to this idea that if you as a performer aren't or as a composer aren't feeling it that the audience won't feel it because there was a study done some years ago about job satisfaction and orchestral musicians ranked slightly below sanitation workers. <laughs> in terms of... Oh, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry if this has come as a shock to you. <laughs> I'm taking over. <laughs> oh my God. Um, <laughs> the fact that we can go to an orchestral concert <laughs> and have a really amazing experience, which is being played to us apparently by 104 people who are bored out of their tiny minds, um, is, is a little weird. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, we've each picked a, a, a piece of music to share with you today that, that for each of us gives us that that shiver, that chill effect. And, and Psyche, you picked an orchestral piece. Um, does it matter to you if you know that that orchestra has been sawing through this piece, you know, all week long and is sick of the sound of it and are just doing what the, you know, the, because it's a job. I mean, does that... Right. I mean, I actually uh, almost chose to become an orchestral musician and then didn't. Uh, and I think it is because, you know, if this feeling that if you're doing the same thing over and over again each day, it might get boring instead of being the thing that you love. But, I mean, but I, I don't think that's completely true. I mean, I, I think that my friends who choose to go into music professionally, they choose it not because they're not good at anything else, but just because they can't, like, imagine dedicating their life to something else, which I think says something about why music is so important because like it's it's um, it's doing something to you emotionally and it's it's triggering your reward system it's hopefully it's good for your brain there's lots of um, uh, lots of work on that as well um, but I think at the end of the day like um, even when the bored orchestral musician is 
performing on stage in a concert, um, I think they do enter a different world that is professional and is together and is um, kind of in it for the greater good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the, the, the other stuff is, you know, maybe like um, union administration. I mean, all these other things that... Well, I think there's also a question of agency. You know, musicians right. like to make the music that they want to play. And when you're an orchestral musician, you play the music you're told to play in the way that the conductor is, you know, at his or her tempo and, you know, you're waiting for your cue, et cetera. So there is a question of agency. I, I mean, with all due respect to orchestra, I know many of them and they, they're deeply committed. Right. Um, but there is that, they're not getting that little pop that, that you're getting when you hear this piece. Explain uh, what this piece does for you. So Rachmaninoff, um, second piano concerto, uh, second movement, um, and I chose the beginning of it. Um, it's really... kind of a hushed, tremulous yeah. opening there. Yeah, I, I think it's setting up a lot of um, action that's about to happen. Um, and I think that feeling of anticipation, uh, there's also a lot of chord changes, and we know from um, John Sloboda's work in 1989, 91, that um, chord changes are more likely to elicit that feeling of, um, of uh, like, as of your heart skipping a beat. Uh, whereas melodic changes um, and certain, I mean, there's music theoretical predictors for like how you make these melodic changes, um, but those are more likely to make people cry, right? So, so you have different kinds of strong emotional responses um, that are triggered by different kind of compositional devices, and which is I, why I think that, um, I mean, I, and I think that composers kind of implicitly know about these types of devices, and that's why um, they're able to deploy these tools of music theory um, to make a rewarding experience for audience. Well, when you get to, you know, things like rhythm, you're you're getting back, aren't you, to the lizard brain, the you know the the brainstem and the you know the the, the, the fact that we learn early on to entrain mm -hmm. to to a beat. I mean, isn't so? I mean, it sort of comes back to what I was saying before about music affecting different parts of the brain um, on a physical level. Right. You know, that part, Ed, of the brain is being, right. being so reached as well as the sort so of prefrontal. So it's not just the brain stem for rhythm. It's, it's auditory cortex, it's right. motor cortex, it's the basal ganglia. Um, and, you know, these parts of the brain have intrinsic rhythms. And, and, you know, there's a lot we don't know about the brain. But one of the things we do know is that uh, it communicates within itself via rhythms and, and different kinds of, of oscillations that are going on. And one of the most, I think, amazing discoveries in the past 20 years is that when we listen to musical rhythm, our brains synchronize those intrinsic rhythms to the rhythms of music. That's, um, the, that's the process known as entrainment? Entrainment, yeah. yeah. Uh, does your musical example give us, uh, you know, a sense of that? Yeah, so I picked one that, that, yeah, would exactly show that off. And it happens to be, so, so one of the things that happens when we listen to rhythmic music, it happens to everybody, is you'll find yourself tapping your foot or bopping your head. Um, this, um, and, and that feature of music that makes you want to move has been termed groove by one of our colleagues, Peter Ginata. And he did a, a, a large study of all different kinds of older music and newer music and had undergraduates rate the groove. And this piece that I chose was the one that they consistently chose as number one. And I do this experiment in my class every year. My undergraduates consistently choose it as number one, even though it's from the 70s, so. It's Superstition by Stevie Wonder. <laughs> I see you. <laughs> When the clavinet comes in, yeah. you know, and adds its layer to the groove that's already been established, then it's just like, I mean, then the brain is suddenly like, what just happened? Yeah, <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> what would that look like, uh, David, on, you know, if, if you had hooked 
one of Ed's undergrads up to an fMRI while that was happening. Any idea? We can uh, take any of you and hook you up. Not so much an fMRI. Uh, fMRI is a wonderful camera. It's a camera that takes pictures with very high spatial resolution, but it's to, to capture this kind of thing, you need a machine that actually has a high temporal resolution so you can follow the rhythm. So fMRI is not so great that you want something like EEG, which many of us use, or its big cousin, magnetoencephalography, that's like a, you know, a giant recorder of brain activity. And what you see and what we can measure is how different parts of the brain entrain. Right? So it's the brain is hijacked by rhythmicity. Mm -hmm. It's a, you can't stop yourself. And you see the brain activity, the, the waves of the brain surfing on the <laughs> waves of the sound. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of inescapable, right? So the sound can be, can be kind of conceptualized as a series of waves that we can you know, analyze in all kinds of ways. And the brain activity literally surfs on top of that, whether it wants to or not. So, so you're actually seeing jet. movement, motion so of you, Well, you see, I mean, that's how we visualize it, but you see yeah. the, so the brain, so Ed mentioned, you know, the, the rhythmic brain activity in different areas, or we call them neural oscillations, and you can imagine that as the brain breathing at different rates, yeah. right? So at the level of single cells or local networks or larger networks, the brain is breathing at faster rates and slower rates. It has to do with biological uh, factoids that we don't have to unpack here for fear of losing your audience. <laughs> um, but these are um, sort of optimally suited to grab on to the rhythmicity of the piece. So when you're listening to superstition, different parts from the periphery to the central part of the brain literally are just locking on mm -hmm. or entraining to this. And so you, you can't stop yourself. How much of this, Megan, do you think is cultural? Would, would an Australian Aborigine in the, you know, in the outback be as quick to entrain to the groove of a Stevie Wonder as anybody who grew up with, you know, Western pop music? Well, perhaps. Th you know, there is some evidence that the emotions that are perceived in music are perceived to a certain extent at a universal level. Um, so if you are an individual from a particular culture, you're going to be better at identifying emotion in music from your culture than you would for other cultures that have music that you're less familiar with. However, you'd still identify the emotion above chance. And what that tells us is that there are some universal features that are used to detect emotion in music. So when we think about uh, emotional responses to music, it's actually helpful to distinguish between the effective response that you have and what is being communicated by the music. And within a given culture, there are these, these codes that exist that tell the listener that this is a sad song, or this is a happy song, or this song is uh, you know, going to induce fear. And those codes are fairly well uh, established and agreed upon by listeners within a culture. So one of the interesting things that you'll see is that uh, listeners will very quickly uh, identify an emotion that's communicated by the music. They can do so after hearing only a quarter of a second of a song. And mm. the, uh, the level of agreement between listeners is actually really high, particularly within cultures. Now, how that translates to your emotional experience, you know, the emotions that you feel in response to the song, that's a, a different question. So you have what's being communicated by the music, and then you have the factors that lead to you actually experiencing an emotion. And the field really makes a distinction between the two. Uh, you sound like you're probably familiar with the work of Thomas Fritz among the yeah. Maffa people, mm -hmm. um, where he, I mean, the Maffa live in the, the highlands, I guess, of Cameroon and had minimal contact with the West and Western music. And he went there with a series of, of pieces of music and a happy face, a sad face, and a scared face. And consistently, the Maffa were able to, hearing Western music for the first time, or you know, keyboard music for the first time that he had brought to them, were consistently able to identify correctly the emotion. And then even more unusually, he brought some Maffa music back to Germany, and the people there were able mm -hmm. to identify correctly you know, the emotions that that, that music was, was carrying. I wonder for you, Mari, having, did you grow up with uh, traditional Japanese music as yeah. well as Western? Well, yeah, I grew up in Japan. I was uh, uh, telling your producer that there's a song, a uh, children's song, it's a very innocent uh, fo folk song. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
right? It's like yeah. a happy song. Yeah. <laughs> it's a song about uh, little uh, uh, bubbles. You're b blowing bubbles, and bubbles fly to the uh, ceiling, um, the roof. Oh, it hit the ceiling and it disappears. Oh, wind! Don't blow, blow the, you know, blow. Uh, let the, the let the uh, uh, bubbles fly, and it's just just this innocent song. And then uh, it turned out the composer's daughter died, so the lyrics is about uh, the daughter who uh, who died. So he says, "Don't you know kill my um, my daughter." So after I knew that, I cannot listen to it in the same way anymore. Yeah. Right. So it's like very. I s grew up singing that song, but now I can't. You know, it, it, I relate in a different way. Okay, so this, this gets to an interesting question, which is, let's say, just for sake of argument, that, and this, I know this isn't true, but let's just say that everybody who grew up on Western pop music hearing the opening of Superstition is going to get that little pop of dopamine or whatever, you know, that little hit, that little shiver down the spine when that keyboard comes in. Um, would that happen when that listener is two or three, or does that listener have to have some experience to know something? I mean, at what point does your own cultural and individual experience completely alter or color your response to music? So, um, you know, it's interesting, you know, and, and a lot of people make this mistake. They think, well, you know, I sit down, I listen to music, I start tapping my foot immediately, therefore it's, you know, it's innate, it's inborn somehow. But in fact, there's a long trajectory to the development of, of rhythm perception and, and rhythmic um, interaction with music. So it uh, turns out infants, uh, if you test infants the day after they're born, you play them different kinds of sounds, you play them speech, you play them music, they'll move more to music, but they won't synchronize. They, they can't synchronize. Um, it turns out that um, if you play them rhythms uh, from, uh, the Western culture and um, Balkan cultures like Bulgaria, mm -hmm. they can tell the difference between those rhythms when they're six months old, but by the time they're 12 months old, they undergo perceptual narrowing, and now they can't make those distinctions, similarly to speech or to faces. Um, and it's it, uh, kids that are two and a half, three and a half, four and a half years old still can't synchronize very well, um, but they synchronize better if there's a person in the room to synchronize with, and it's, they're six or seven years old before most kids can really, you know, dance in synchrony with music. Hmm. You know, I mean, there are exceptions, right? Right, right. Justin Bieber being one, right? I mean, you've seen the movies of you him had playing. To go there, didn't yeah, you I had to. Go. But um, you know, there are there are sort of uh, rhythmic, um, you know, rhythmic geniuses out there. But you know, most kids they're they're six or seven before they can really synchronize with music. But you know, even to come back to what David, what you were saying about Mari's piece, Alt, that you know, you heard something in it that she probably hadn't intended, but three or four-year-old David Pepper might not have known what to make of, of that, you know? I mean, there's, you, you're bringing a lifetime of, of so auditory bring, experience. I mean, if, of course, you bring and one of the, the delicious parts of human experience is that we have a hard disk of life in our head <coughs> that colors everything. So <laughs> what we bring to every experience, whether it's music, the visual arts, dance, theater, the, what the art historian Ernst Gombrich called the beholder's share, which is, I think, a beautiful phrase. And so for me, the beholder's share to your piece was uh, finding something different in the, you know. So I, I, I don't want to skew this discussion too much towards meaning, but I will anyway. <laughs> yeah. the, uh, because a, a second example that just came up is the one you gave with the Japanese uh, children's song, which, uh, sa you know, you hear it for the first time and you think, oh, that has a cheerful thing. The moment you tell the story, it colors it in a completely different way, right? So now I, too, cannot hear this. <laughs> this is kind of, oh, this is this joyful, you know, rah-rah, yeah. the, bo the balloons are flying up or the, bo the blown mm -hmm. bubbles. Knowledge is a dangerous thing, and knowledge, your preconceived... Uh, you know, what the, the priors you bring with you to a perceptual experience color your interpretation of that. And so it can be, high, and that, that, of course, invariably leads to individual differences because we all have slightly different things on our hard disk. And your hard disk includes a little area devoted to the music of Tom Waits, <laughs> which... Uh, 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 
surprisingly big area. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, I, I am uh, uh, to the to the dismay of my my f my wife and sons, who are all musicians, incidentally. Uh, I am a, a, a deep fan of Tom Waits, and I selected a song uh, for, for a particular reason. I think it makes a few interesting points, called uh, Kentucky Avenue, which is about childhood and pairs well with your. I don't say a word. I'll take a rusty nail and scratch your initials in my arm. I'll show you how to sneak up on the roof of the drugstore. I'll take the so this one works for me every time. <laughs> okay, so I get and, and why why did I well I selected this simply because I like it. And, uh, but it makes a couple of points that I think are germane to our discussion. One is the, so this is about childhood, right? This is a song about, about all the weird stuff that happens when you're a kid and the compelling effect it has on your head. So the stuff, you know, the you first time you heard certain things or you fell in love or you kissed for the first time or you had some awful experience with a parent, anything, the stuff in your childhood has a particularly compelling grip on things. Uh, th that's one point. So our experiences early on really uh, color stuff later very profoundly. The second point I think is, uh, which is interesting, and I think we, you know, it's easy to overlook, although we all have this experience, is that uh, material that's putatively sad, which this song is, can give you a positive aesthetic experience, right? So sad things are supposed to be sad, and in real life, sad things are sad. We don't seek bad experiences, we seek positive experiences. But in the arts, one of the fascinating things is that uh, negatively colored emotionally things can be experienced as wonderful and aesthetically engaging and moving. And that's one of the most exciting things about the arts and then music really brings it out in this magnificent way. Yeah, Megan, you've done a lot of work with this sort of the behavioral kind of responses. I mean, wh what, what is it about the sad song that we keep coming back to it? Well, it might be that it's one of the safe ways that we can experience this emotion without having any sort of personal consequences. I mean, uh, you know, in, uh, when you have sadness that's evoked through, you know, traditional ecological means, it's because you've experienced a personal loss. No one wants that. Uh, but music and art in general gives us the chance to explore these emotions that we tend to avoid because they have no consequences in this context. So we can go to the theater and enjoy being really frightened because we know that we're not in danger. And music may be doing the, the same type of thing where it gives us the chance to explore negative emotions in a way that have uh, no consequences for us. Yeah, and I think that um, it's really about experiencing a certain beautiful thing together, right? The, the fact that we're in it together. I mean, I think that um, a lot of the experience of music moves us because um, it's a kind of a resonant um, um, emotional experience across a lot of people. And so we've done some work looking at um, brain differences between people who get chills when, often get chills when they listen to music, uh, compared to people who don't when, you know, controlling for all these different variables. Um, and it seems like the auditory areas are actually more connected to areas of the brain that are important for social and emotional processing um, among people who al always get chills. Um, so it's as if, right, when you're listening to something that's beautiful, um, it's a songwriter's way of going straight to your um, social and emotional processing regions of the brain through an auditory channel. So Megan, um, the music that you chose for us is a sad song. It is. But it's a very different kind of sad song from Tom Waits, you know, lonely guy at the bar at closing time, sort of. <laughs> yeah. This is, I'm sad and I'm storming the gates of heaven to let the universe know it. <laughs> um, what was, what is it about um, this excerpt from the Mozart Requiem that, that does it for you? Yeah. So, one of the things that happens in the, the clip that we're going to hear is that Mozart created this beautiful melodic line that doesn't resolve in a way that you expect it to. Uh, so the end of the melodic line ends on a, the seventh scale degree, and we generally expect that to resolve to a very stable scale degree in music that we call the tonic, and that doesn't happen. And I think that leaves the listener wanting more, and it gives you this, this sense of, of, of 
you know, lack of fulfillment, yet there's, there's such beauty in that and there's mystery. And for me, it, it definitely uh, causes all sorts of emotions. Well, this is, so this is some of the lacrimosa from the Mozart Requiem. been used in a car commercial recently. <laughs> um, which is pretty telling, actually, right. you know? Right. You had your emotional experience. Long, 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 what what yeah. kind yeah. of car? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't remember the brand, but it's, it's, a, recent, it's a recent commercial. Uh, but, but this piece has been used in films, mm -hmm. many, I mean, you know, this, this has that, that, especially what we heard at the end, where the, the, the voices come back in, that's, that's become a kind of iconic musical moment, you know, in film and TV shows and you know, music, music consultants love this piece because it has a lot of emotional content, not necessarily the one that the text would, would lead you to expect because lacrimosa is tears in, in Latin, but this, People hear something grand in this, and something elegant, and you know. So, th this, this. Idea, so you said there are lots of emotion in this. Right. For you, what do you hear? Well, one of the interesting things about this melodic line is that for me, it it reminds me of the sound of someone crying. Hmm. So you know, the fact that it it is lacrimosa tears uh, may have some direct relevance to how he decided to create that line. Maybe he was trying to emulate the types of sounds that people create when they're crying. Uh, so uh, for me, this, this taps into this very basic type of, of sadness response, and yet it's not my sadness. So for me, that, that becomes translated into an aesthetic response rather than me f you know, becoming personally sad. Instead, I appreciate the beauty of it. So if you're feeling a kind of response on a purely aesthetic level, are you less likely to get that shiver effect than if you're actually responding to it as if, you know, that's your emotion that's being yeah. prodded? Well, the, the shiver is uh, thought to be an aesthetic response. Yeah. Oftentimes, uh, the, the songs that are most able to create the shiver response are sad songs. Hmm. Yet people say that the, the, the response is highly positive. Uh, people generally don't think that they're feeling sadness when they experience this extreme emotional response. So the, you know, what is being communicated by the piece may be very different than what is being experienced by the listener. The listener response may be highly pleasurable, even though the piece is really sad. And actually, that kind of brings us to, to the, the piece that I chose, which um, is something I've only recently discovered and which... I'm not sure I know how to s set up other than to say it's a man and a woman in a room, in their living room. There are uh, Bruce Green and Cor Loy McWhorter. I think they're married. They're in North Carolina. And they sing old folk songs, like generally lesser known, pretty dark, you know, the, what, what the critic Real Marcus called weird old America. You know, the, um, and it's... it's it's one microphone, there's no reverb, it's just two voices singing, I'll say together, but you can decide for yourself. The song is called Come Near My Love. Come near my love, I'll answer your questions. I'll tell you things that you should know. By the night shining moon, I'm bound to be leaving I'm bound to turn my head and go So, I don't know what the hell is happening there. I mean, 
Harmony. They, but what yeah. kind? I so mean, fourth. Parallel fourth. But they, they, <laughs> but it's not, it's not tempered. It's not the parallel fourth. Sometimes it's not parallel. Maybe that's what the ringing is. Uh, they sound like they're droning, first of all, yeah. you know, rather than that's singing. the sound of the fourth, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, so, mm -hmm. and it, but it's, again, it's not a, it's not a tempered, mm -hmm. it's a pure, mm -hmm. yeah. it's, so it, it's wrong. It's not, it's not the fourth that you'll get at a piano mm -hmm. or, or a guitar, although you could do it. Pythagorean? <laughs> Pythagorean, <laughs> maybe. I don't know. Um, you know, I, I'm often listening to music while I'm doing other things, and I just stuck this CD in because a friend recommended it, and I was just like rooted to the spot. as what is that? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it was unexpected, and, you know, just like different from anything that I had heard from, uh, you know, Mountain Appalachian, the high lonesome sound. It's definitely not that. It's definitely not... Nashville style harmony. It was, it was just really kind of unexpected. Right. Well, you know, it's funny. You started out the conversation by saying, well, you know, 30 years ago there was no music neuroscience and so forth, but really music has been studied in science since there was science, at least in the West. And Mari brought up Pythagoras. You know, um, Pythagoras was, some, it was yes. considered by some the first scientist in the West. And his question was exactly that. Why do, they, why, do two notes, why do those two notes sound so good together? You know, and uh, we're still asking the question. Right, and why we should not let these two notes play together because they make people do it's impure things. things. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> That's, right. That's right. So that whole, and you know, that, that lasted, I mean, uh, you know, in the, the early, in the 18th century, Johann Matheson in Germany, uh, the Affektenlehre, a doctrine of the different affects that scales would, you know, this scale will make people slit their wrists. This people will make people run out and, right. you know, make bad decisions with the next person of the opposite sex that they meet. And right. this was really, you know, this was seen as science. Mm -hmm. And, you know. Well, you know, I mean, I think, uh, you know, a lot of um, thinking like that went way off the yeah. tracks, right? right? But um, there's also a lot of um, good evidence that there are physiological responses that, that, um, that we have. The brain, going back to the brainstem, uh, responses in the brainstem in the early auditory system that, uh, that correspond to our feelings of, you know, what this harmony makes us feel. I mean, you can almost, in that song you played, you can almost just hear one harmony. It doesn't yeah. even need to progress, and you can already feel an emotional an emotionality out of that. So I don't think, although, you know, it has for the past couple hundred years been, um, you know, very fashionable to discount that, that way of thinking, yeah. I think uh, people are beginning to come back and say, no, may maybe there really is something about the way we respond to individual intervals that's really important. Give me some news you can use. Why is this important to study? What does it tell us? What, what if any, use is, is this? Uh, scientifically, behaviorally. You mean music in general? No, this, uh, this, our, our exploration of, of the kind of emotional and the physical effect. I mean, in look, I mean, the, the, I, I think we shouldn't have to justify this. So let me disagree with the question. <laughs> I mean, the, the premise of the question. So obviously there's an... It is a world science festival. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so, yes, but, so that's why, you know, we do science because we're... Uh, we can't help ourselves trying to understand stuff. And so there's a deep value to basic research. There has to be no nugget. So it turns out that there is because there's fascinating therapeutic implications uh, our understanding of music. But from my point of view, we do basic science to simply understand the parts list. We're here we're trying to understand the parts list of the mind, the brain, and music. And so there are two things that can happen. We can use music to understand something about music and something about the mind and brain. And we can use neurobiological methods to understand something about music. These are perfectly valuable and reasonable things, and there has to be no end game. If there's a pill or a lotion or a car I can buy, it matters not. Okay? So we, we do basic science because we're wired to have, we have a science-forming faculty. We just try to understand stuff. And that's a very important, and we should not forget that part of science is just that. Mm -hmm. It's not trying to come up with, a, with an application. It's to satisfy 
curiosity and to let our minds wander in weird directions and say, damn, that was interesting. And turns out music is an extremely well-structured domain to learn something about how the mind and brain are organized. And that's deeply exciting and satisfying. Yeah. Yeah, I can't I agree with that more. I mean, I, I, but I also think that the reason why I do science is so that I can understand more things and so that I can be more open-minded towards new ideas, right? I mean, before I started doing this, it was like, oh, of course you listen to Mozart because he was a genius, because he sounded good, and he was good because of, of all these, you know, all these ways. But then you hear about all the people who are here, you know, who are kind of deriving different experiences from the same thing, you know, like the Laurel Yanni illusion. Right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, and then that, I mean, thinking about that just makes you appreciate like diversity more. Uh, it makes you more open-minded, I think. Megan, do you, do you have more of an application-based <laughs> uh, approach? Well, I think that addressing this question in general it raises new questions about the nature of music and, and the significance to the human species. So if you look at the brain areas that that have the strongest response when someone is experiencing chills, you see that they are the same brain areas that are involved in rewarding behavior that has biological significance. So acquiring food, having sex, and these brain areas are also responsive to drugs. So when we see that music is activating these reward centers, we have to ask, well, does it have any sort of biological value for humans? Or is it hijacking these systems in the same way that drugs do? Mm. And that's an open question. But I think this type of research raises those questions, and those questions are important to understanding what is music and, and why is it important to humans. How about you, Ed? Um, well, I want to start out by agreeing with David because I, I'm 100%. I think he, uh, he's, he's right on with that. I think, but I want to add two things to it. One he touched on, which is with music, music is so well structured that it allows us to go and see the brain when, when we you know, uh, use EEG or MEG, we can see with the rhythms of music, we can see so clearly that brain entrainment. You know, uh, people like David have spent a lot of time uh, studying speech, and it's in some ways the structure is not quite as clear. But in music, we were able to first go in and say, oh my gosh, the brain is really entraining to music. And then pretty soon, people like David were saying, hey, guess what? It's happening for speech too. <laughs> so, um, so, so it, it gives us a kind of a, uh, of a way to, to focus the brain on this rhythmic thing. And then I, I will go and, and talk about some applications. So it turns out um, that there are a lot of kind of disorders uh, of the brain um, in which you find uh, people also have a problem with rhythm. Okay, so um, autistic kids have a problem with rhythm. People with specific language impairment, people with dyslexia. Um, and there are other ways in which, uh, so we, we're not exactly quite sure what that means yet, but there are other very clear ways in which people are using music therapy uh, to clinical benefit. So to help people rehabilitate speech after a stroke, for example, with mm -hmm. melodic intonation therapy or um, uh, rhythmic stimulation can help people uh, rehabilitate their gait if they have Parkinson's disease. So there, there really are, um, we are beginning to understand that there may actually be some clinical applications to music, and a lot of them have to do with rhythm. Well, it's, it's, uh, and it's funny that we're coming to this realization at a time where there are lots of musicians who are kind of pushing at the borders of what we consider to be music as opposed to noise, and, you know, bringing, I mean, that, that we could go down a whole rabbit hole uh, but instead, I think what we're going to do is open the floor to questions from you folks. Yeah. In talking about the fundamental processes uh, involved in uh, engaging with music and talking about rhythmicity, that suggests if it's so fundamental that it would be happening in other species as well. So what kinds of properties here generalize, can, that we can tell generalize the experiences that say dogs or apes or others have of music? Oh, that's a really great question. Is that Finn, by the way? Hi, Finn. How are you doing? Um, so, uh, did you plant a question in the audience? I did not plant a question, but I, I'm, I'm glad she asked it. Um, there, there are a bunch of really exciting studies going on right now. I don't know, uh, probably many of you in the audience have seen uh, Snowball, the dancing cockatoo. 
Can people raise their hand just so I get an idea of? Yeah, so you can go on YouTube, uh, Dances to the Backstreet Boys. It's very sort of, it looks like he's having a really great time. So um, uh, one of my colleagues, Ani Patel, or two, and jo Ani Patel and John Everson, went and actually studied uh, Snowball and found that Snowball is, in fact, doing a pretty good job of synchronizing. Um, it's intermittent synchronization, so Snowball goes in and out, but statistically, you know, they measure it statistically, it's pretty well synchronized. But, um, so then another colleague of mine, Peter Cook, um, decided to teach uh, a, a sea lion to synchronize. And this is Ronan, who's also, you can see on the web, uh, Ronan. Um, and Ronan synchronizes as well as a person. I mean, just never miss, literally never misses a beat. So there are some animals. We have uh, done some preliminary work with a bonobo, just playing the drums and trying to get the, the bonobo to synchronize. And the bonobo do, will synchronize with drum sounds. The thing about uh, some of these other animals, they'll actually synchronize to music, which we haven't gotten there at the bonobos yet. So there are some people who say, well, you know, it's really a human thing, or you really need uh, to be a vocal learning species. Uh, but then there are other people, things like Ronan suggest, well, maybe it is more widespread, and at least the capability to synchronize. Um, maybe not the motivation, per se, but uh, yeah. All right, let's, uh, let's take one more question. Yes, gentleman in the blue shirt here. Hi, my mom has dementia. She's in her 90s, and in a conversation, she may not remember what you've said 30 seconds before, but she can recall the old hymns, word for word, or if you put on Glenn Miller or Tommy Dorsey or something, she's okay. back out on the dance floor with my dad. What's going on there, and how can it help people with Alzheimer's and dementia? Um, Do you yeah. want to talk about that? I'll, I'll say a little bit. Right? I mean, we know that the, we have this network in our brain called the default network that's constantly on, uh, and that, and especially an area in the frontal lobe, medial prefrontal cortex, um, tends to have less activity over time as you age, and in people with Alzheimer's, it's really much less activity. And so what I think the music is doing is kind of um, acting as a rejuvenator of that system um, so that you're increasing activity in those regions that that might then last a little while. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the brain is a funny thing. And, and you know, people talk about the brain as if it's a computer, right? And we want to know how, you know, this little cog works with that little wheel and so forth. Um, but if, you know, what we learn when we study the brain is that it just doesn't work that way. It works in all kinds of counterintuitive ways. Another thing that you might know is that uh, if you have a stroke and you lose your ability to speak, uh, there's a very a good possibility that you will preserve your ability to sing. And that's now being exploited in, in um, you know, melodic intonation therapy and so forth. And on that note, let me thank all of you for being here and our wonderful panelists. Thank you so much. <laughs>